Hello everyone, my name is Richard O'Hegarty. I'm a postdoctoral researcher from University College Dublin. The study I'll be presenting today is entitled Operational and Embodied Energy Analysis of Eight Single Occupant Dwellings Retrofit to NZEB Standard. So the title is fairly self-explanatory as to what the paper is about, but essentially we have monitored the operational energy performance of eight bungalows post-retrofit and compared the consumption to the expected operational energy performance as well as the assumed performance before retrofit. We also use simple cradle to gate boundaries to estimate the embodied energy of the materials used to achieve the upgrade. Before jumping into it, I'll just give you a quick overview of what I'm going to present. So I'll first introduce some results from the academic literature that compare operational and embodied energy of different buildings. I'll then describe how we compare the operational and embodied energy of this particular case study. The results from this study will then be presented and finally I'll present the conclusions. So to begin with, a quick introduction into operational energy versus embodied energy from the literature. The data you see on this graph has been extracted from the study reference here, which reviewed studies that measured both operational and embodied energy of different buildings. So I extracted the results from the study and compared the operational and embodied energy proportions over the life cycle of a building. I then ordered them by increasing operational energy consumption. What you can see here is that generally, as the operational energy decreases, the embodied energy increases. That is because to achieve that lower operational energy, you often need more materials, more materials, more energy embodied in it. I've highlighted some buildings here to show that while embodied energy can be very high, for example, building A, which was a net positive for a self-sufficient building, low operational energy does not necessarily mean high embodied energy, for example, building B, and high operational energy does not necessarily mean low embodied energy, for example, building C. All the buildings presented here are for new builds, whereas this case study I'll be presenting today in a couple of slides is for retrofits. And while there is a handful of studies on the quantification of NZ retrofits, including some Irish authors who are likely listening to this talk, the amount of studies is limited. In fact, a paper published last year on the topic noted that the scarce data in the literature relating to the energy savings made by retrofit versus the embodied energy investments, and so the balance point between these and hence life cycle energy savings are not well understood. At the time of publication of this paper, um, seven studies were referenced that investigate operational versus embodied energy performance of retrofit case studies. So given the limited amount uh, of studies available to make broader conclusions, this study will contribute to the paucity of inf information by adding a further study to that. This case study in particular looks at eight single occupant bungalows which have undergone a deep retrofit. The two images here show a few of the homes before retrofit on the left and one of the buildings during retrofit on the right. In the image on the right you can see the external insulation being installed. This is an image of the buildings after retrofit. The scheme itself consisted of 12 homes eight of which have been monitored over a one-year period, and those are the results presented here. The retrofit itself involved replacing windows, doors, insulating the walls with 100 mil of expanded polystyrene, and the roofs with 400 mil of mineral wool. Additionally, the old oil boilers were replaced with air source heat pumps, and 1.7 kilowatt uh, photovoltaic systems were installed. All lighting was also replaced with LEDs. The methodology used to compare the operational and embodied energy is presented here. The operational energy pre and post retrofit was estimated using the DEEP software. This was done by our project partner 3CEA. The space heating and domestic hot water consumptions were also measured post retrofit and the savings in annual energy consumption could then be estimated, as well as comparing the expected operational energy performance with the measured energy performance. Finally, the embodied energy of the materials and technologies used to achieve the upgrade were calculated. First, looking at the estimated energy space heating performance as per deep calculations, you can see that the performance pre-retrofit was very poor, with B or equivalents of Fs and Gs, while the expected energy performance post-retrofit were all A2 rated. 
The variation in the results were largely due to variations in the air leakage of each dwelling, which were all measured pre-retrofit by 3CEA. The space heating and domestic hot water were also measured post-retrofit, as shown here between April 2019 and March 2020. The graph shows the monthly energy consumed by the heat pump in orange for each home, as well as that consumed by the backup immersion in black circles. The larger circles show the median of the values and highlight an expected trend of more energy consumption in the winter compared to the summer. It also appears to be the case that the immersion backup heater for the hot water works harder in the summer. This is likely explained by the heat pump system, which is a split system that contains a 200 litre storage tank. It works by heating the storage tank, which provides energy for both space heating and domestic hot water subsequently. And in the summer, as the space heating is not on, the backup immersion needs to work more to provide enough hot water. I also feel this is not the most efficient system, and these heat pumps are being investigated separately as part of another study in more detail. Looking at the annual energy consumption post, um, post retrofit and post occupancy, gives a better insight into the performance compared with what was estimated. You can see that the post occupancy performance for the space heating and domestic hot water alone were significantly greater than the expected A2 rating with BURs ranging from C1 to A3 for the end terrace blocks and B2s were all achieved for the mid terrace. It looks like the mid terrace performed slightly better, which would be as expected although it's difficult to make such a general conclusion with only eight case studies. The results are summarized here, showing the average space heating requirement pre-retrofit and the measured and estimated requirements post-retrofit. Despite the buildings not performing as was expected, there are clearly big improvements compared to the G's and F's calculated pre-retrofit. So, Regarding the embodied energy in carbon, the results for the embodied energy in carbon of the retrofit are shown here. These were calculated by taking values from environmental product declarations, EPDs, where possible, and if not, values were taken from the academic literature. In some cases, there is very limited information and it's an area that needs uh, further research. You can see from both column charts that the renewable technologies, i.e. the photovoltaic installation and the heat pump, are by far the biggest contributors to the embodied energy and to the embodied carbon. The primary energy and carbon were estimated by simply dividing the embodied energy of the retrofit by the annual savings, the savings in terms of primary energy and the savings in terms of carbon pre and post retrofit. The results show that despite the underestimated primary energy requirements as per deep estimates, that desirable payback periods are feasible of approximately two years for primary energy and approximately six years for carbon. Now, these payback periods might be different for the individual components. It might, remembering the last slide, the embodied energy and carbon of the renewable technologies were quite large. So it might be the case that a fabric uh, first approach might actually result in, in lower payback periods. Uh, further, on the point of um, payback periods, the calculations here are based on an assumed pre-retrofit energy requirement. It has been found by a paper in this conference, who has just presented before me, if the schedule is to be followed, that the energy requirement pre-retrofit could be overestimated by almost 50% by maintaining acceptable indoor temperatures. Now, if that was the case, the payback periods would be approximately double which are obviously less desirable, but still not that bad. So, in conclusion, it was found that there was a significant gap between estimated performance and measured performance post-retrofit. Unfortunately, we didn't have measured data pre-retrofit, so we're going by the deep estimates. We found also that there was variability across individual houses, although even though that they were retrofit to the exact same specification, we found that the embodied energy was significant and in particular for the renewable technologies. In fact, the renewable technologies accounted for 81% of the primary energy embodied in the total retrofit and 91% of the embodied carbon in the total retrofit. 
Finally, it was found that desirable payback periods were obtained, although these could have been better if the performance post-retrofit was per deep estimates. And on that, I'd like to thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the conference. If you have any questions, please ask. Thank you.